Welcome to Pleasant Valley. If we haven't met yet, my name is Rhett. Sure glad that you're here today. Would you please stand? And let's worship the Lord together this morning.
Would you be seated? Welcome church family here at Pleasant Valley or joining us online. Maybe today is your first time to uh, be with us for worship. Perhaps you're returning from uh, visiting with us last week at Easter. And regardless of how many times you've ever been at church, there's a place for you here. We want you to know that you belong. And scripture invites us to remember when we gather, to remember the incredible sacrifice of Christ on the cross that we worship last Good Friday, but to also remember the amazing promise of his resurrection and forgiveness that we celebrated last Sunday for Easter Sunday. And so today we're gonna to participate in remembering together by taking communion together. So if you have the elements. And I wanna share from the book of Mark, there's an account where Jesus is with his disciples at a table for dinner leading up to his death and resurrection. And I love that imagery of the table. I want to remind you that there is a place for you at Jesus' table. And so in Mark chapter 14, we see that Jesus is actually teaching his disciples and he's teaching us about what is about to transpire. And so in this teaching, we remember that his, that his death wasn't just for back then. It's not just for today. It is for all of eternity. And that his love isn't just for us right now. It's forever. And so if you'll take the bread with me. And Jesus says in verse 22, he says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, this is my body. And then Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. Together we remember what Jesus has done for us. And it is for everyone. And so will you stand with me as we continue to worship God in Christ and all that they've done for us.
is hard, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me. separated from you. And we thank you for that today, God. We gather in your name. We worship you, God. And we look to you now. Open our hearts and minds. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Well, you may be seated, church family. Uh, my name is Wes, and I serve as the pastor of Next Gen Ministries here at Pleasant Valley. Uh, I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive the offering. Uh, this is one of the moments in our service where we want to just say thank you. Uh, as, as, as followers of Jesus, uh, as parents, we want to instill the value of just gratitude. And I stand before you very thankful for all of your generosity and your patience as we have persevered through several months of remodeling our student space down at the south end of the building. Uh, if you came in uh, this morning, you noticed the fences are gone, uh, the garbage cans have been removed, uh, the, uh, all of the materials and, and things, construction uh, related are, are gone. And we are really excited that next Sunday, uh, we will invite our middle schoolers to have small group uh, in our brand new space uh, for the very first time. And then we'll continue with our regular uh, student ministry programming uh, down there in this space. Uh, I should be applauding you and thanking you for the generosity and the sacrifice and the investment that you've made in the lives of our students. And if I could just take my pastor hat off for a second and put my dad hat on, uh, I have uh, middle school daughters uh, that will, be, uh, will benefit from uh, the ministry and the life investment that will take place uh, in that space uh, for uh, the next uh, season uh, of ministry in my own family. And I know that many families here uh, also have, have kiddos that benefit and uh, are recipients of your love and your care, your coaching, uh, and certainly our, our biblical shepherding uh, of their lives that will uh, in, impact a faith uh, to last them a lifetime. And so I wanna say thank you. Um, and at this time, we will uh, receive our offering. Well, yesterday, for the better part of the day, uh, my family spent time with, uh, uh, with grandparents and aunts and uncles at a, uh, in the cornfields of Stanbury, Missouri. Out there on road letter M, my father-in-law built a little cabin where we could gather and roast hot dogs and go on hikes and enjoy nature. You might think of all places, why Stanbury, Missouri? And well, that's where my father-in-law is from. In fact, that's where he got his start. And I, and I read something this week that said, home is where you started. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I reflected on that, you know, I'm, I'm from, uh, I grew up in Hendersonville, Tennessee, just about 30 minutes north of Nashville, but, but I got my start in Murfreesboro, which is a little small suburb. And so as we continue to grow in community and and meet and greet with one another, I wanna invite you to stand and just to share with a neighbor, where did you get your start? Would you stand with me now?
go. Test one, two. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We were testing my mic out while you were talking, and y'all talked so loud, Bruce couldn't even hear me talking. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Hey, I am glad that you're here. If you're here as a guest for the first time, we want to welcome you, whether you're here in the worship center or if you are in the chapel or if you're online. Pleasant Valley, why don't we greet all of our guests who are with us for the first time. We're glad that you're here. So uh, this happened, uh, I still remember the first time this happened to me. Uh, it was the second sermon I ever preached. I was, uh, I'd been a Christian for about six months and I sensed a call to ministry, uh, go figure that. Uh, didn't have much of a good church background and so I knew enough to be dangerous and so they let me preach one Sunday at the very best Baptist church. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? the very best Baptist church. I was actually licensed for ministry at the very best Baptist church. Yeah, put that in your resume. When we came here 17 years ago and they looked at our resume, they said, he's in. Look at that, right there. So anyway, it was the second time I'd ever preached, and the first time I preached, I did a pretty good job, but the second time I preached, my father-in-law walked in. My father-in-law was a good man, a bit intimidating, uh, because uh, I wanted to marry his daughter, and so that's what was intimidating, and so we hadn't been married yet. We were dating. He was still, still doubtful whether or not I was really uh, worthy of his daughter, and I, I wasn't, but... Uh, the, Grace of God, right? Grace of God. All of the men in the house know what it's like to marry up. Amen, men? Amen. You should have said that with a bit more enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm trying to help us all out here. Isn't that right, men? Amen. There you go. All right. We're slow, but we get there. And so, uh, anyway, uh, my father-in-law walked in uh, right when I started to preach. And my father-in-law was a lay preacher. He had... Uh, he told me a lot about it, never heard him, and, and so he walked in, and I was beginning to preach, and then I went completely blank. One of the best three-minute sermons that church has ever heard. <laughs> anyway, and, and over time, I have recognized that one of the things that I struggle with is a bit of performance anxiety, and uh, to this day, I'm now a little bit older than that, and I've preached a few more times, and not at just the very best Baptist church, but at, at the pretty Baptist church. And so, uh, and, um, and so it's, uh, I, have, I have it almost every single week. And so what I want to talk about is, is what is the most common uh, human feeling? Uh, you could call it a, 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 a mental health issue, the most common mental health issue in our country is anxiety. And it, it comes in various kinds of forms. It, it, it can affect everything in the workplace, and it can affect your, your relationships. I'll tell you about another time, since I'm confessing this, so you'll feel better about yourself. Uh, this was a number of years later. I was in Topeka, Kansas, and I had been invited to pray at the governor's prayer breakfast. And this was a big deal. There were about a thousand people there. I was a church planter. I knew some folks who knew some folks, and they said, we want you on the main, you know, uh, stage here, and you get to get your food, and you get to sit up there by all of the, the dignitaries, and then at the very end, we want you to come in and give us a, a benediction. And so the guy that spoke that day was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, Dr. Lloyd John Ogilvie. And uh, I was pretty nervous about being up there. And, uh, and as a, I had to get up really, really early. And so I consumed an awful lot of coffee. And Dr. Ogilvie spoke for a really long time. And I'm feeling nervous about getting up there, and I've had a lot of coffee. Don't go where you think, I'm, gonna, I'm not going. I'm not going there. But uh, he actually prayed at the end of his talk. And while he was praying, I snuck off the main platform to the restroom. 
thinking that I would be able to come back and nobody would know. Uh, but it didn't happen that way. <laughs> when I exited from the facilities, everybody was leaving <laughs> the event. And so uh, I have a little bit of struggle. I'm struggling right now. <laughs> I didn't drink near as much coffee, so you're good. It's all good. I'm good. Anyway, uh, anxiety is a real deal. And it isn't, uh, it isn't just for some kind of folks. It, uh, uh, 40 million adults struggle with anxiety. That's about 20% of the American population struggles some with anxiety. Young people struggle with it more than adults do. As a matter of fact, nearly 50% of all people, young people ages 18 to 24 report suffering from these kind of anxiety symptoms. Women, you are more than twice as likely as men to experience anxiety. And do you know why? Because we bring anxiety to you. <laughs> That's the reason you've got anxiety is because of, of, of men. That's not true according to the research. But anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. Anxiety disorders are often treatable, but check this out. 60% of people who struggle with anxiety never seek help. It's treatable, but we don't want to admit that we have a need. So you might be thinking, what is anxiety? Whenever Jesus talked about do not worry, the word worry literally has to do with the strangling. It's like choking. It's like, it's like you're, you're, uh, my mom used to struggle with anxiety and she'd say, I can't hardly swallow. And that would be a literal way of describing that was a description of anxiety. Now, if you were to ask the American Psychological Association, they would say anxiety is this. It's anticipation of a future threat. It's all about the unknown. It's about what we can't control. It's about what is out there that, that, uh, that we don't know about. And the result is we will experience muscle tension. And some of us want to, want to deal with anxiety by avoidance or by isolation. So if you experience symptoms like this, apprehension, worry, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, problems sleeping, physical symptoms such as increased heart rate, sweating, or shortness of breath, your body is telling you something that you need to pay attention to. Your body keeps the score. Your body is a way of telling you how you are doing inside. It tells you the condition of your soul. Now, there's a difference between general anxiety that we all have and what might be considered an anxiety disorder, which is an emotional state in which anxiety, fear, and tension become so severe that they get in the way of being able to function in your everyday life. Now, here's the, the good news. You don't have to be dominated by the strangling pressure of anxiety and worry. You don't have to be dominated by it. That's the good news. The Bible addresses it head on. The Bible doesn't pretend. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat. The, the, the Bible deals with anxiety, and it offers help. It offers positive help. We're in a series that we're starting today called Cultivating a Non-Anxious Life. So what we're trying to do is find from Scripture tools that are founded in truth that will help us deal with what is common that all of us, for the most part, struggle with at least from time to time. And how do you go about living a non-anxious life so that in your world you can be a non-anxious presence of strength and stability? Paul said this, I'm not, it's not going to come up on the screen, Paul says this, Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So think about it like this, I often am anxious about what is in the future, what I perceive to be a threat, what I cannot control, and Paul is saying, listen, when you're feeling that kind of stuff, what you do is you bring it over and you give it to God. You unloaded onto him with prayer. And then he says this, and the peace of God which transcends understanding 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It will be like 24-7 protecting your mind from continually going down and ruminating over what might happen. The Apostle Peter put it like this, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In other words, take all of the, the anxiety that you have as baggage that is weighing you down, unload it, and then give it over to him because he cares for you. He knows you very well. Now, in my journey, especially over the last several years, Psalm 23 has become for me, again, the place, but we'll call it this, it's the soil where I have been cultivating a non-anxious life. It's great soil for cultivating that kind of life. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to slowly work through Psalm 23, and what I am praying is that each week we will ask God to take the truth of Psalm 23 and put it deep down inside of us, put on deposit and let us really apply it and, and just let it reside with us. And then along the way, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some spiritual practices that will be helpful in going about cultivating a non-anxious life. And so every week, every week we're going to read it. And uh, we're going to work on memorizing because that's one of the scripture passages that, uh, and one of the spiritual practices that's really, really important. So if you're wondering when we're going to get to Psalm 23, hang on. We're going there, all right? Now, Psalm 23 is considered a song of trust. Psalm means song, and so the book of Psalms is the Hebrew hymn book. And so whenever you read a psalm, you have to think about it a little bit differently. You read it and you interpret it differently from a narrative, from a history passage, from a letter that Paul has written, from a parable, from a precept. And so let me just give us some ways of thinking about and reading psalms that will be helpful for us. Uh, Number one, it's good if you're dealing with Psalm 23 to read it out loud. Now when you think about it, Songs were meant to be sung out loud. And if these were songs that the Hebrew people sang, they sang them out loud. Now, I know when I read Scripture, I don't typically read it out loud, but there are times when the reading it out loud is really, really good. And so what I'm going to invite you to do, if you're able right now, I invite you to stand together with me. We're going to read this out loud in unison. And I've chosen the English Standard Version because it's probably the one that's closest to the King James Version that we would all have memorized. So here we go. We're going to read this out loud. We're going to read it slowly. In unison, here and in the chapel, in the foyer, wherever you are. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. So we're going to do this every single week, and I'm going to encourage you outside of the services to do this as well. Read the scripture out loud, and then read it thoughtfully. The Psalms are poetry, and and you may not like poetry, but one of the things I know about poetry, you read poetry slowly. You read it thoughtfully. You think about the imagery that is there. It It requires thoughtful consideration. So let me give you a sacred practice on how you can go about reading Scripture in such a way that you do it thoughtfully. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. All of these things start with an R. They're not coming up on the screen. They're coming up right here from me, okay? So, read it repeatedly. 
One of the best things that you can do with a passage of Scripture like Psalm 23 is read it repeatedly, and then second of all, reflect. Reflect on what stands out to you. What word stands out? What phrase stands out? What imagery stands out? What, what emotion surfaces? And then number three, respond. What is the invitation that God is inviting you to be or to do? And then four, rest in it. Simply sit with it. Let it, let it percolate. Let it marinate. Let it saturate in other eight words that I don't think of right now. Just, you let it just take up space in you and you rest in it. And then part of that resting in it is you pray it back to God. Read, reflect, respond, rest. That's how you go about reading it thoughtfully. And then pay attention to the imagery. One of the things that you notice about Psalm 23 is what? The imagery is going to teach us about who God is, and it's also going to show us who we are. It's going to reveal God, and it's going to reveal us. So you pay attention to the imagery. God is like a shepherd. Life for us is like sheep. We need green pastures. We need still waters. We go through valleys of great darkness. We, we have enemies that are around us. We have a future that we're looking forward to. And so you read and you pay attention to the imagery. So let me give you the big idea for today. If what we're doing is we are cultivating a non-anxious life, the big idea and the place to begin to cultivate a non-anxious life is this. Cultivating a non-anxious life begins with knowing God personally. With knowing Him personally. And I hope through uh, the time that I have, you're going to see the importance of of why knowing God personally will help stabilize your life and help you to experience a non-anxious presence. It starts with Him. So let's just go back to verse 1, and we're going we're gonna to spend the rest of the time on five words. Verse 1 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. Now, next week, we'll get to the wanting section. Today, we're going to get to the first phrase. There was a little girl that announced that, uh, to her mom that uh, she was going to draw her a picture of God. And the mom said, well, sweetheart, how are you going to be able to do that? Nobody's ever seen God. And she goes, well, they'll know what God looks like when I'm done drawing this picture. And there's a sense in which what Psalm 23 does is it's painting a word picture of who God is. It's letting us know what God is like. And my hope is by the time we get finished with Psalm 23, we're going to have a much better idea about the character and the nature of who God is and how knowing that can actually help you in a very practical way whenever you are experiencing anxiety. So I'm going to shift gears right now for just a minute. I'm going off script for a minute. There's something that just came to my mind. A spiritual practice that I have learned that helps me deal with whenever I am feeling anxious, whether it's coming up here to preach or whether it's anything that I'm getting ready to have to perform, one of the things that I've learned along the way is to practice a breath prayer. How many of you, show of hands, have ever heard of a breath prayer before? Now, I'm not talking about, I mean, it's always good to breathe. That's always a good thing, and if you're not breathing, it's going to be really hard to pray. And so uh, a breath prayer is simply this. It, it is a short statement where you inhale and exhale. And let me just say this. In terms of anxiety, one of the best things that you can do is learn, learn how to breathe and learn how to breathe slowly and learn how to breathe deeply. Karen has told me often that I do not breathe. I'm always holding my breath. And when you hold your breath, you know what that's a sign of? Anxiety. It's like I'm always alert. I'm always on guard. I'm always, it's a, I've, I've got to perform. It's that fight or flight kind of thing. And she'll just look at me and she goes, take a breath. And then it's kind of like, oh, okay. So you can take this first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you make it a breath prayer. So you find yourself in an anxious moment. You take a breath in. 
Lord is my shepherd. And then you breathe out. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And it has a way of centering your life on a truth. And as I've said, cultivating a non-anxious life begins with knowing God personally. And so who is this God that we are to know here? Well, to say that the Lord is my shepherd is to make a statement of reverence. It's to make a statement of reverence. It says, the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's the personal name for God, distinguishing him from all of the other false gods of the day. And if we were going to try and translate it, which it's really virtually impossible to translate, the best way to translate it would be like this, to be, is, or as God told Moses, I am. To say that the Lord is my shepherd is to say that the self-existing one the one who causes everything to come into being, the one who is, has always been, and has never not been, is the one that is present in my life, guiding me, shepherding me. One author put it like this, though he creates, God was never created. Though he makes, God was never made. Though he causes, he was never caused. He is unlimited, and I'm limited, and that causes me to feel anxiety because I know that I am limited in my capacity. I'm limited in my energy. I'm limited in my wisdom. I'm limited in my finances. I'm limited in so many different areas, but God himself is unlimited. He is ungoverned, but I'm governed. I'm governed by gravity. I'm governed by uh, the seasons. I'm governed by everything that is outside of me. God is not governed by anything. He is unchanging, and I am subject to change. Anxiety flares for most of us because there is so much change that is always happening around us, and oftentimes change you cannot control. It'll be, change in, it'll be change in your health. It'll be change in your thinking. All of this kind of change that comes can cause anxiety to flare. And yet what David is saying this is, listen, Yahweh is my shepherd. The one who is, the one who is constantly present, the one who is unlimited is the one that is undergirding my life and guiding my life. Yahweh was the most popular name given to God in the Bible, and it was so revered among the ancient Jews that they would never speak his name. They would only write it. And if they did speak the name of God, they substituted Yahweh for Adonai, Lord. But whenever they wrote the name Yahweh, each time they did it, they would have a new writing instrument and new ink. For instance, if a scribe were going to be, were go, were going to be copying scripture and he came across the name Yahweh, he would find new material that he had never used before. He would get a brand new pen. He would get brand new ink. And every time in copying scripture that he came across the name Yahweh, he would do the same thing over and over again. On top of that, whenever he was doing that, whenever the name of God had to be written, scribes would take a bath before they would write it. They so revered it. The ancient Jews went to extremes in their reverence for the name of God. What about us? I wrote this down for me. Do I find myself overwhelmed with life because I am underwhelmed with God? I don't see God for who he is. Maybe what the deal is, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, maybe the problem with some of us is that we have shrunk God in our minds. And when you shrink God in your minds, then problems loom larger than they really are. The truth is this, problems won't last forever. 
but God is. Friends can comfort you in the midst of a storm. God's the one who can still the storm. So if you're going to cultivate a non-anxious life, it starts with knowing God personally. And that means you have reverence for him. And to say that the Lord is shepherd, second of all, is to make a statement of dependence. To make a statement of dependence. Now, you and I are, you and I as Americans, we celebrate independence. We have Independence Day. We love our independence. We don't want anybody else trying to take control of us. We resent it when other people make decisions for us. We prefer to be in the position of strength where we're the one that have others dependent upon us. We don't want to be dependent on anybody. But one of the things I've had to learn over time is that admitting need really is a sign of strength. To not admit need is a sign of pride. And the Bible says pride comes before a fall. And the Bible says God, God humbles the proud, but he exalts the humble. The Bible says that God's power is perfected when we are at our weakest point. So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he is making a statement of dependence. I am depending upon the Lord. Now here's the deal. Let me just say something to men for just a minute. I, I, this is a generalization, but that means it's generally true, right? Hello, right? It's generally, generally so. Oftentimes men struggle with admitting any kind of need. At least the men that I grew up around uh, had a tar- hard time admitting need. You just didn't do that. And David, David was a warrior. David was a king. David would be considered a man's man. And yet, David acknowledged his dependence on God. If David, King David, was willing to admit that he depended upon God, then then. We've got a good track record ahead of us that we ought to do the same thing. But David was not only a king and a warrior. David was a shepherd at one point in his life. He knew what every shepherd knows. Sheep are highly dependent on the guidance and in the care and the protection of the shepherd. I mean, whenever you look at a sheep, do you think attack sheep Do you think I'm going to get a guard sheep to protect my house? No, you don't do that. I mean, sheep are sheep look weak. Sheep look dependent. Sheep, sheep look sheepy. And I'm told of all the livestock. uh, I I I grew up in farming community, and and we had some goats, and we had some chickens, and we had a calf, and we had a Shetland pony, and and uh, and we had a we had a pig, and. and Suey was her name. And uh, the thing that I know is that of all the farm animals, uh, you know, uh, lining up all those, all so much smarter than sheep. sheep. Sheep can be counted upon to be the most dependent farm animal there is. And David is saying, God is my shepherd, therefore the implication is I'm like a sheep. And therefore I am dependent upon God. So when you call the Lord your shepherd, you're saying this, I need help. Let's try that together. Let's try saying that together. I need help. Okay, let's try that. Okay, one, two, three. I need help. One more time. I need help. One more time. I need help. Sometimes the best prayer that you can ever pray doesn't have to be long. It's just this. Help me, Lord. And when my preaching is bad, say it out loud. Help him, Lord. (laughs) I'll receive that. I'll receive help from the Lord. I'll receive help from you. Whenever I say that the Lord is my shepherd, I'm saying there's no one better than God to be able to help me in this moment. What I'm saying is this. I'm basically foolish. I am unwise. I am ignorant. I, I, I am weak. 
Therefore, I am saying, God, you're strong. God, you, you know everything. God, you're wise. I need some help right here. I need help figuring out what to do. I need help to know what is in front of me. What's the wise thing to do? Give me some discernment about what I need to do about a future that I might be afraid of. We're saying that God is absolutely trustworthy and we can depend on him when we are saying that the Lord is my shepherd. He has never been known to harm any of his sheep. He's never lost a single sheep. He is committed and dedicated and even willing to put his life on the line for a single sheep. John includes in his gospel these words of Jesus, John 10, 11, Jesus speaking of himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Verse 27 through 30, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. To say that the Lord is your shepherd is a statement of reverence, it's a statement of dependence, and it's also a declaration of personal relationship. It's a declaration of a personal relationship. Maybe you've never heard this before, but there are some people who think it's arrogant to uh, be convinced that you're a Christian and say so. They argue that you can never say with certainty whether or not you are a Christian and to, and to say that you are and to say that you have that kind of relationship with God is the ultimate of pride. But think about this for a minute. Would it be arrogant for a child to say, that's my mom, that's my dad? I mean, if there is, if there is anything that ought to be able to you ought to be certain about as a child being able to say, that's my mom, that's my, that's my dad. There's nothing strange at all. There's nothing arrogant. There's nothing prideful about saying the Lord is my shepherd. David didn't say the Lord is a shepherd, one of many. He didn't say the Lord is the shepherd as if God were distant and remote. He said, no, the Lord is my shepherd. Think for a minute how weird it would be for, you, for me to introduce you to Karen and say, this is a wife. <laughs> or this is the wife. No, this is, this is, Karen is, Karen is my wife. Many people speak of God in generalities. I don't speak of Karen in generalities. I don't generally say, well, you know, generally she's my wife. No, she, specifically she's my wife, right? Can I get an amen? Yeah. I know that I'm talking about it like she's right here, but you know what I'm saying. God never intended us to relate to him in generalities. He never intended us to have a general understanding of him. He always intended for us to be in a personal, vibrant, life-giving relationship with him. He invites us to life with him. He wants you to know that he can be your shepherd. There's a story about a little boy who was who was desperately ill, and so the parents knew that, uh, that he was terminal, and so they invited a pastor to come over and spend some time with them and with their little boy, and the boy was, was semi-conscious, and uh, he was unable to, uh, to speak, and the pastor came over late in the evening. The little boy was, was unable to speak, and uh, he, he never spoke in the presence of the pastor. And so the pastor uh, spent some time with the parents and then spent some time with the little boy for a bit and then went home late that night. And so the next morning he, he returned after he had heard that the boy had died. And so he did his best to console the parents. He, he wept with them. He, he prayed with them. And then a little bit later on, the parents asked him if he had any explanation for something that had happened after he left. They, they told the pastor in the hours after he left that uh, before the son died, the son had 
taken his hand and he had grabbed a hold of the ring finger of the other hand and uh, he was holding on to it before he died and when he died his hand was still on the ring finger and uh, the pastor said well let me explain what I did in your child's room when I went in and sat down next to your son I took his hand and I wanted to be able to convey to him the the importance of being a Christian and but I wanted to do it in a way that a child could understand so what I did is I took his hand in my hand and I took his thumb and I held his thumb and I said the because I'm getting ready to talk about the the one and only and then he took the next finger and he said Lord and then he took the next finger, the middle finger, and he says, is. God is right here with you right now. And then he took the middle finger, and he, I mean the ring finger, and he said, my. My represents a personal relationship. Represents a connection. Shepherd. The one who cares for, the one who loves you, the one who sent Jesus to die on the cross for you so that you could know God and have eternal life. And the pastor said, now while the child never spoke, evidently the child heard. And so before he died, he put his one hand on the ring finger that symbolized my to acknowledge that he had received Jesus to be his shepherd. Is the Lord your shepherd? Has there, has there been a point in time where, where you have said, the Lord is my shepherd, Jesus is my savior, God is my God. Not in generalities, but specifically. God wants to be your shepherd. And so what I want to do is, I'm getting ready to pray with you, but, but I'm going to invite you to do something. If you're ready to claim in a spirit of reverence to God and dependence on Him, that you want a personal relationship with Jesus, your good shepherd, I'm just going to ask you right now, this is between you and God. If you've never done this before, you've never trusted your life to Christ, I'm just going to ask you if you'll grab that ring finger and you'll join me in prayer. Thank you, God, that when you created us, you didn't create us to be robots. You created us as human beings. You created us in your image. And being created in your image means that we are person. And we have capacity for relationship. You are our shepherd and you want us to acknowledge that we trust that you truly are our shepherd. Jesus, that you're the good shepherd. I pray right now for individuals who are sensing and hearing your voice for the first time to say, trust me, commit your life to me today. Claim me as your savior. Move from generalities to specific. Move from religion to relationship. I pray that today that they would step in the direction of that voice because they know it's your voice. And that today would be a day of new beginnings. And God, for those of us who have already done so, would you help us once again just to simply affirm that the one and only God who has always existed and always will exist, the one who is present right now, is our caregiver, our leader, our guide, our protector so that 
we are able to cultivate this non-anxious life, a life that is lived with the, with the faith in your goodness and the faith in your presence. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And collectively, we said, and before I turn this over to the uh, chapel, I just want you all to stay connected for just one minute. Some of you actually did what I invited you to do. And I want to say congratulations to those of you who stepped across the line of faith and for the very first time said, I am trusting my life to Jesus, my good shepherd. We want to hear about that. If we're willing to confess Jesus before men, before women, Jesus said, I confess you before my Father in heaven. You wouldn't want to be ashamed of the one who unashamedly went to a cross for you. And so, as soon as the service is over with, we're going to have some friends here in uh, the front. You'll have friends in the chapel. We're going to have some uh, staff and pastors that are going to be in the back part of the worship center. So we're going to have, coming or going, you're going to have an opportunity to talk with somebody. Would you tell us about your step, your step of faith? Some of you are struggling with anxiety, and you just need somebody to bear that with you. Uh, Bear one another's burdens, Paul says, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. We want to help you bear the burden. If you need us to pray with you, we will do that. If you find yourself severely struggling with anxiety, we've got a counseling ministry that would love to walk with you and help give you some tools and some presence along the way. And I hope that you will come back next week as we continue cultivating a non-anxious life. God bless you. We will see you then.
Thank you.